to show you. I'll show you one that's doing that right now in a little bit. But if you look right here, these are its two feet, and it's moving them pretty slowly right now, but it is actually moving those two feet. Those two feet are little tiny suction cups, and those two feet allow it to suck onto a rock and stay put so when crashing waves come, it's not swept out to somewhere it does not want to live. It can hold on really tightly. Now those two feet do something else for a sea star. Those two feet actually help the sea star eat. Would you guys like to see its mouth? Can you point to can you point to your mouth? Okay, you ready to see where the sea star's mouth is? It is right here on the bottom of the sea star in the middle of all those rays. Right there. Pretty interesting. Now when a sea star eats, it does something kind of disgusting, actually. It loves to eat things like mussels and clams and different shellfish like this. So if it were to meet a tasty shellfish like this guy, it would get on top of it. It would sink all its arms or rays around it. It would use its super strong two feet. And then it would actually squeeze open the clam just a little bit. And then it would do is it takes the stomach and shoots it out of its mouth into the clam, liquefies the clam, and slurps it back up like a milkshake. So basically it makes a mussel or a clam milkshake. Pretty gross, right? But I always think a sea star probably thinks it's disgusting that we eat with our hands and, or with our knife and a fork. They probably think that's, that's weird. So I'm gonna put this guy back. This is an echinoderm. Um, and an echinoderm means spiky skin. So if you take a real close look at this, you'll see that it has some, some pokes and spines, right? That's what an echinoderm is. Spiny skin animal. Now I have another echinoderm. And it's right here. Whoa, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> this is a sea cucumber, right? This is a sea cucumber, and it's also an echinoderm. It does look like it has some spiny skin, so it's actually really soft. This guy looks very pokey and dangerous, but it's actually really, really soft and squishy. And if you look underneath, it has some similar features to a sea star. It has a lot of two feet, and those two feet are starting to poke up right here. And it's what allows it to crawl over rocks and different surfaces to find its way around. So this animal really likes to live in salty water too. It will live down in the deeper tide pools, right? So places that don't dry out very often. It also likes to live right near the mouth of these hard fish, right? right along the rocks that have been put in there. And so that's where you can find some these guys. Now this guy does something really interesting to protect itself. Right. One way it survives is hanging out with his feet and finding nice little places to hide. But the other thing it does to protect itself is if it's scared, it will actually spit its guts out, right? And then walk away from them. Isn't that crazy? So if it's scared, it will spit all of its stomach content out, leave it there for whatever wanted to eat it, and it will regrow a new system inside. Pretty fascinating. All right, so those are just some of the animals you would meet in the and there's uh, other creatures besides echinoderms that live in the bay and in tide pools and work uh, have to have adaptations or changes in their body system so it works to let them live in that situation and one of those is crabs and so we're going to look at a couple of crabs here to see what they look like so you can see this tank has rocks in it right here. And you may not be able to see the crabs real well, but here's a rock crab right here. And so as you take a look at this rock crab, um, he's a nice looking crab. Uh, this is a Japanese rock crab. Um, he's a, um, this one is a male, as you can see. Uh, it doesn't have its big pinchers on the front right now. They came off uh, before we caught him. Um, but they'll regrow those as they shed their shell because they have to shed a shell. But he's got really pokey legs and he can take and hold on to things so that when um, he's in the rocks and the water around him, he can hang on to things. He's trying to crawl right now, but he can hang on to things uh, really tightly and he's really good 
at moving around rocks and hanging on the rocks. And when the tides come, you'll just find a place in the rocks to squeeze underneath to survive. So that's a creature that lives in rocky shores. And uh, usually they're in the entrance of bays. They're not necessarily at the bay front itself, okay? Uh, if we look at another creature, uh, here's one right here, and he's all hunkered down amongst the rocks too, so he's a rock crab. And this one here looks a lot like the other one, but he's kind of speckled, um, if you look at him, underneath. And he's trying to always look how tight they can hang on to things. Isn't that amazing? how tight they can hang on to things. And they got that entire sea store right there up and out of the water. So, but that's the way their legs are. They're made to hang on to things. We'll tip him back over there. Uh, but look at his feet and they're kind of speckled. So that's where he gets the name speckled rock crab. And again, this one is, uh, we'll talk about males and females for a minute here, only because if you actually go crabbing, you can only keep male crabs. Uh, that are the Dungeness type. I'll show you those later. Those are a bay crab in the sand. But this is a rock crab. So this could be in tide pool areas. It could be on the rocks just as you enter the bay, but it's a rocky creature and it's, it gets around by having these really pointed legs that can really hang on to stuff and hold itself tight as the waves come in and crash around it. Um, and you'll often see them when the water is low or it gets a little bit warm, they'll be foaming around the mouth right here. And uh, that's actually storing, blowing air bubbles and uh, able to breathe a little bit as water dissolves into air around their mouth. Okay, and these are all their mouth parts down here. But that is a rock crab. This is a speckled rock crab with huge pinchers. Would you want him getting a hold of you? No, I wouldn't either. So you have to be very careful. Now, amazingly enough, these guys, after the first little bit, are really calm and they tend to not pinch or do anything strange like the other crabs they'll pinch pretty good but these guys the speckled rock crab are pretty safe about it so if i put him back in he'll find a way to crawl that back down under the rock now here's this one i'm going to grab another crab out of here if i can find him um where'd he go that's a fish okay let's see maybe i'll show you one later i'm going to look for a hermit crab and hermit crabs live inside shells like this black turban snail. Uh, could have a crab in it. So we're going to go and look at those at another tank in just a little bit. But I want to now look at a, a, a crab that's found in the bay. Okay, that definitely in the bay. Uh, they can be in the ocean too on sandy bottoms. So the difference in, a, in a areas is the sandy, uh, sandy bottom from which you can see a little bit better light. And these are the Dungeness crabs. Now, uh, Dungeness crabs uh, like to bury in the sand. So they're a sand crab, okay? So their favorite thing is to live in a bay and to swim up and down in the, with the bay, in the bay, uh, with the currents come in and out of the bay. Um, you can kind of see that shape and the symbol, kind of the cancer symbol. Uh, which is why it's called a crab, Latin crab is cancer. Uh, magistra is this one. Uh, and so you can see that, that structure and you can see a space. Now he, they can get really feisty, but their legs instead of having little points at the tip are actually a little bit flatter and they actually dig in the sand really, really well uh, and bury themselves. So when the tide comes in and out, they protect themselves by just crawling under the sand and covering themselves up. And then, when the tide is calm, they come out of the sand and then they feed on whatever they can find. And this one is a male also because it's very thin. So if you happen to collect one of these, you'd have to look at the abdomen down here. And if it's really thin across, that is a male. And I believe I have a female here too. So I'm gonna compare the two right now. So I'm gonna hold them up. Oh, that's a male. Okay, I did have a female in here. Might be this one, it was a small one. There's a female. Look at how wide she is across the bottom right there. Can you see that? How wide versus how skinny this one is. This is a female. That's a male. That's where the babies hide. So the babies go in there and they live in that area and uh, uh, after they uh, breed. So that's a female and this one's a male. And the females can get just as big as the males. This is just a big male uh, and a smaller female.
Okay, so that there's other crabs too that live inside these areas, and we're going to look at them in another tank later as we compare how creatures live in uh, rocky areas like tide pools and how they live in uh, sandy areas or in the channel like in a bay. Okay, Claire, so we're going to switch Claire, to. Uh, yep. I I just asked the students who here has seen a crab dig in the sand. And I had a number of students say that they'd seen them dig just kind of how you were describing before. Oh no, we may have lost Claire. Hold on. Let's see here. I'm going to... Amy or Chrissy, if you can hear me on one of your other devices, we cannot hear you right now. Okay, Amy, one second. Megan, can you unmute my iPhone because we had a camera issue? Hello, Megan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, yeah, Chrissy, is that you? All right, Chrissy and Amy, you should be able to unmute yourselves. Okay, we're... All righty, we're sorry. We're really sorry that we lost you a minute ago, but our phone died here as we're trying to show everything. So we're new at this too. So hopefully you had a lot of patience with this. And uh, we're gonna look at another crab found in the bay. And it's this crab right here. Uh, it looks kind of like a spider down there. Can you see that crab? Kind of looks like a spider right here. And we're gonna pick him up and take a look at this crab. Now this crab uh, has legs that are really good at holding on to plants and things like that and he's really holding on to that pump and he looks a little bit like a spider doesn't he and this one look how wide it is that's his abdomen so what what is the sex of this is he a male or a female whoa i bet some of you guessed it oh yes you're right it's a female look at that because it's so wide down here and she'll hold her babies inside that area. Now look at the pinchers on this crab. Instead of being big and fat and thick and crushing clams or mussels or other types of things, which is what crabs eat, they're scavengers and they eat dead things. Sometimes they eat live things, whatever they can catch with their pinchers or break, they'll eat. Uh, this one's got little tiny thin pinchers. He uses that to eat eel grass. Uh, he doesn't eat eel grass. He strips the eel grass of food and climbs up and down on the eel grass. And he's kind of like a nice little pincher. He can pick things off the eel grass and feed himself into his mouth right here. That's his mouth right there. And can feed him, feed herself and eat all the little creatures that live on eel grass. We're gonna look at eel grass later in another crab over there. But this is a kelp crab. Look at the back of it. It's really different shape, isn't it? Really a different shape with a kind of almost a nose and two spines that stick out the front. Very different than another crab. And this is one that lives in the estuaries, uh, in a bay, in estuaries with eel grass. And we'll show you eel grass in just a little bit. And this one, oh, it's got a funny little thing on top called a barnacle. And we're gonna talk about barnacles right now with Chrissy. All right, some pretty cool animals so far. So what I have here in this tank is something that you would also tend to find at the beach. This is a bunch of mussels. Have any of you seen mussels at the beach? Mussels like to cling onto the rocky shoreline that we have at the Oceanside Beach and they have lots of really interesting strategies to help them survive and because they do that they actually provide habitat for a lot of other creatures. So if you look at all these mussels right here you may notice that living on them, in between them, crawling over them are lots of other animals. See how many you can see? Right off the bat, I can 
now. I can see. I'm going to take this little piece of buffer. Can I just turn the actual buffer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so right here, we can see this fish. It's a sculpting. This fish disguises itself really well. Can you notice its colors? Isn't that an interesting adaptation it has? I'm gonna give it a gentle touch so it will swim, but you'll notice it's black and white. It looks a lot like mussel shells with barnacles living on them. Here is a mussel shell right here, and all these little white things that are kind of sticking up off of it are little tiny acorn barnacles. So this animal actually looks a lot like a mussel. It's just sitting there, not moving. So I'm gonna give him a little touch. Little girls, you guys can see a little girls. What a beautiful little creature. Right. He likes to live in the tide pools and uses very he, she, I don't know. Uh, that animal uses lots of really interesting camouflage to stay hidden. Now, right here is what we're talking about. These darker shelled animals right here, these are the mussels. And mussels actually make these strings you're seeing right here. These are called bissel threads, and they are super duper strong, really strong. I am pulling pretty hard to get just one of them to come off, right? Now they make a lot of these. Look at me, I'm trying to pull it apart. It's very strong, very strong, right? They make a lot of these and they stick them to each other. They stick them to the rocks. Why do you think they would do that? And they're really hard to get off. Why do you think they would do that? That's how they survive in crashing waves, it stops them from getting washed away. Now, if we look in between them, we already noticed these little acorn barnacles, but also living here are other types of barnacles, including these guys right here, or right here, these are gooseneck barnacles. What I wanna do is I wanna take you next door where I have a bundle of these. Oh, before I do that though, this guy's really funny. Relate it. I'm getting my arm very wet. Whoa, isn't that beautiful? This is a sea slug. It's actually related to the mussel. It just doesn't have a shell. It is called a sea clown. And it's called that because it sort of looks like a clown. Have you ever, guys ever seen a clown at a circus or at a fair? I see some heads nodding, that's great, right? They often have very colorful polka dotted outfits, sort of like this friend, right? So this is, um, this is related to a clam, a mussel, it's even related uh, to an octopus, which is really interesting, right? And these slugs are like slugs that live on land, but they just live in the ocean and it rolls around, rooms around, sorry using its foot right here, okay? And right on this end, it's its mouth. I'm all about showing you where mouths are because I think it's interesting to compare where our mouths, where our eyes are, to where these animals are and how they use theirs. So I wanted to make sure I showed that to you before we moved on. And I'll make sure I show you its eggs too after we visit the next station. All right. So down here, I actually took a bunch of mussels and I put them in here so that we could, we could actually separate them and see what was living in there. And so if I take this, this muscle mass and I pull it apart, I will find, and it's okay to do that because they can actually remake all these threads and reattach. They already attached themselves to the bottom of my tank. If I pull it apart, I will see in between that there are lots of other animals. So, for instance, this little friend right here is a different type of sea cucumber. And I have another one. It's more stretched out. Do you guys remember the big red pokey looking one? The red sea cucumber? And this is a different type. This is a mussel sea cucumber. It lives in between all of the mussels. It's also an echinoderm, which means it has kind of a bumpy spiny skin and uses tube feet different things just like a sea star or, a, or the larger sea cucumber will, but instead it lives in between all of these mussels. Another thing that lives in between all the mussels is this friend right here. This is a little tiny dogwinkle snail and it has its foot out. Oops, look at this, look at this. Sea cucumber does not want to let me go. It's hanging on. All right. 
So you can see this dogwinkle snail has putting its foot out. This is also related to the sea, the sea slug. It's related to the mussels. And it is it's a type of mollusk. And it's putting out its foot right there. Now, if I touch it, it's going to go back in. And all mollusks have something really interesting, or one-shelled mollusks, which are a gastropod. Right? All of them have something interesting. They have a door that they can close. Right? It's called, and you get to see it on our bigger snail. And it's a little tiny piece of shell. And when they get scared, they actually pull it into their shell and lock up their front door. And it helps keep them safe. And it helps stop them from drying out, which is another thing all these animals have to deal with. They have to deal with the fact that sometimes our bay is flooded with water and sometimes it's not. And so they all have to either move with water or they have to be able to withstand drying out. All right. Did everybody notice how Miss Chrissy was very gentle with our tide pool friends? Something we want to be sure of when we go to the tide pools is to be gentle with our creatures that we find. That's an excellent point, Amy, you're right. And so even though I showed you this bundle of mussels and we kind of took it apart, I was trying to be very careful about looking where my animals were. And I know that these animals can reattach. Other animals, we actually might hurt them if we try and pull them off the rocks. So like a sea star, if you try and pull that off the rocks, you might actually pull its two feet off. And the two feet will be left on the rock and you'll be holding a sea star without two feet. So. We want to make sure that we don't pry things off the rocks, that we use gentle touching when we go and explore. You actually will see more cool things if you just watch with your eyes and, and look for things to move around too. So I'm just gonna just let you take a look at this really closely and see all the different animals. There's one type of barnacle, on top of it's another type of barnacle. Over here we have a gooseneck barnacle, so that's three types of barnacles already. Um, we also had a limpet that I lost. And there's another sea cucumber living in there. There's an anthropod. Just fell down. And there was a really crazy worm. I'm going to try and find it while Mr. Thomas is sharing some information too. So we're going to come back down the tanks here to a tank that's found in the estuary away from the rocky shore, the tide pool areas. And this is a sand tank. So in the water, there's lots of sand creatures. And you can see, like right here, there's an eel swimming across. There's a little creature right here called a crangon that's in here. It's a type of a shrimp right here. Oh, there he goes. Whoa. You can see there's the little gunnel eels kind of going across. A lot of creatures here. Oh, look at this one. That is a moon snail right there. Here's his little antenna where his eyes are located there right here on the bottom. This is uh, where he breathes, his gill. And that little isopod right there, it's kind of green and lives amongst the weeds, the grassy weeds, the, the eel grass in the bottom. He's just sitting right there on the edge of the moon snail. Now, moon snails are kind of interesting because they go in the bay and they'll lay eggs. And this is a moon snail egg case. And I'm gonna move it out. If you're in the bay looking, it looks like there's a vase in the bottom of the bay, sitting on the bay. But that egg case is composed of about uh, probably 10,000, a million, 100,000, I don't know how many eggs, but every little sand grain around there is glued together with mucus and has eggs in there of moon snails, this creature. Can you show from the top maybe? That the moon snail, you can kind of see up here, kind of clearly, the, the uh, the, the gills that I'm going to move. Oh, I touched the antenna and they moved down. This is the, the velum and then we're going to move it down and take a look at, oh, he's kind of resisting that just a little bit, but it's the part of the moon snail where the digestive glands and the food is. Some people think this is an eye at the end, but the eyes are actually, we're on those antenna out here. So we're going to pick him up and just take a look at how big he is and then how he survives. So he is pretty big, don't you think? Is that pretty big? Look at that shell, and he's already pulling up. He's covered up the end of his shell, the umbo part. And if we flip him over in here in the water, we can see where his mouth is right here. So he actually goes along the bottom of the, uh, the sand and he burrows into the sand. He'll go down as much as uh, 18 inches on regular under the sand. So you often don't even see them in the bay, even though in Neetart's Bay, where we got this egg sack down here, 
the egg collar, it, there was probably 200 of them in the bay this year. So a lot of moon snails. They burrow down and they eat clams under the surface of the water. Okay, so they'll burrow down all the way down to uh, consume clams. Um, and they can go down as far as some of the gapers, though most gapers might be down at um, like three feet. They don't go that low, but they will go 18 inches down, which is basically the length of your arm. They burrow in the sand and mud. And they drill a little hole with a little drill they have right here. If I put my finger in his mouth right here, there's a little drill in here. I'm not feeling it today. I felt it last time. He doesn't, isn't at the surface right now. And at that point, he will drill a hole in his shell and leave a little concave hole about the size of like an end of a pencil, not the pencil point, but the whole end of a pencil. And he will then digest the, the creature from that hole. He'll put juices in there and digest him. Okay, and that's the way a moon snail eats. And I'll put him out here, see if he'll come out again on the glass, because he was really thinking the glass was a fun place just a little bit ago. And we'll see if he'll stay there for a minute. Okay, now let's take a look at the creatures over here to the right of him. And that's, oh, he just, maybe I'll just tip him over just a little bit. He'll find his way. You don't have to take too much care of any creature as they take care of themselves. Okay, so these are sand dollars right here. Can you see the sand dollars? And they sit on the surface and they kind of bury themselves. And sand dollars are really, really cool. So I'm gonna just pick one up so you can kind of see it here. So it looks like that. Okay, um, and if you look at that sand dollar, I have a, have a tub over here. I'm gonna show you some things with the sand dollar. And you can see the backside, there's kind of a pattern like a sun star. I mean, a starfish, can you see the five rays? And it's got little spines, and remember sun, starfish were called echinoderms, that means spiny, echin is spiny, and derm is skin, and so they're spiny skin. And you can see this one has spiny skin, right? There's the spines, you can see them moving back and forth maybe in the light. Can you see those spines slightly moving? Just starting to move, oh, they're moving a lot right here now. Okay, they're moving and what they do, they'll crawl with those, but they also uh, will feed with those. And so they'll, sometimes they'll go down and um, when they're flat in the, in, this, in the tank, like right here in this tank, they're really flat. They're actually feeding off the sand and that's what they were doing in that tank. So they're filtering sand and running the food through the sand particles in these little grooves, the oral grooves right here. And they were moving that across to the center. And, uh, and then they were eating it in the mouth right here where he has this little, mouth that he can actually go and crush things or poke into things with. He'll also sit sideways in the sand, and these were doing it earlier over in that one, but they'll sit sideways in the sand like this, and they'll just sit up there like that. I'm going to put them back in this tank here so you can kind of see this, and when they sit like that, like this, oh, there's a sand dollar underneath him there. Okay, we'll move that. When he sits like that in the sand, he's actually catching plankton on the edge of his spines and then feeding them into his mouth below. So he also, so he can filter sand, he can also eat plankton like it's in the water, like a filter feeder, like a clam. And he'll also, as they feed, they'll often get little crustaceans um, that are in the water. Those are little tiny things like whales eat, like krill little tiny, tiny crustaceans. And we'll look at some in a tank, another tank here in a minute. And they'll actually uh, catch those in little spines. They'll catch them in their spines and trap them like a pyramid. And then they'll move those to their mouth. And the radula, that's actually what the radula crushes and eats in a sand dollar. And so these can be found in densities. I think I've read up to like three or 400 in a square meter, about this big by that big. And they'll be stacked down in the ground, two and three layers deep. and in, in a low tide, and there's gonna be a lot of them in there. These right here all started on top, and you can kind of see in there that they started here and this moved this way all the way to right there now. And you can see them kind of how that they've moved around inside here. And these all are all trying to feed on sand right now, filtering sand. Okay, on this tank beside it, you'll see something else that likes sand, and these are clams. So clams, uh, live in the bay also and they like to be in the sand or in the mud that's in the bottom of the bay. So we have lots of types like these little guys here they can grow as big as my hand so they can grow really big. We just have small specimens here. This is a cockle with lines that run down 
And the cockle likes to sit on the surface of the sand and put out a foot that kicks around and they can move quite a good distance. The tide can carry them quite a ways. And if a sea star, like Chrissy was talking about how a sea star covers it and then can pry it open and put his stomach in there and digest the clam inside its own shell. Well, they can actually take their foot and thump the sea star and get away from a sea star. Isn't that cool? Oh, what a great mechanism for getting away. Oh, here's a larger cockle right here. Okay, there's a little larger one right there. Okay, so he lives on the surface. Here's one that lives down a ways, and this is actually one of the favorite one of the moon snail to eat. And oh, he had a neck out right here, his siphon, where he siphons water in and siphons water out. Well, it turns out, I'll put him in, see if that neck will come back out again. That's a butter clam. Now, clams are filter feeders, just like the uh, mussels that Chrissy was showing you. So they suck in water and they push out water and they can filter a lot of water just in an hour, liters of water in just a, just a period of an hour. Um, and so they're one of the things that keep our bay really, really clean. So if you go to a bay that doesn't stink, it's probably got a lot of shellfish in there. Okay, here's another one. Now this one is found in the rocks. So this is one that likes the rocky shore, not the sandy shore. It's a scallop. And this is a rock scallop. And there's a lot of good meat in there. People can collect and take these off the rocks and collect them and eat them. If you've ever gone to a restaurant and had scallops, you're eating something that's related to this creature here. This is a scallop that lives on the bottom next to the rocks in the sand. And notice the difference. He can open and close and swim around. So it's one of the swimming clams. Uh, but uh, the rock scallops generally, they attach to the bottom on a rock and they never move again or uh, they're stuck there. But the others, a sand scallop uh, that has this pattern, kind of like a shell gas station sign. I think we still have those around, don't we? Okay, they actually are patterned after this kind of a scallop, kind of flat across the bottom. And uh, these guys also have eyes about 20 eyes around their surface at every one of these ribs that come down. Kind of cool. They don't see like we do. They see light and dark because as they're swimming, they don't want to get into a dark cave because there might not be any food in there. They need light for photosynthesis to make their food. We get our food from sunlight. Uh, makes food through plants. All right. This is an eelgrass. We're going to move now to another sandy habitat. Eelgrass is found in muddy sand. And uh, hey, or sand or muddy sand, and this is eelgrass tank, and you can see the eelgrass. Yes, Megan. Um, I think maybe we should just uh, pause for a second and uh, take some questions because that was just okay. a lot of information. So if you have if you have any questions right now, go ahead and write them in the chat. If you have questions about crabs, or questions about clams, or scallops, or sand dollars about echinoderms. Well, Megan, so do you want us to keep going? Yeah. We have one question that is, um, did you catch, or how did you catch the sand dollars? Oh, great question. Um, well, they are out there in Neatarts Bay, and, and actually um, at low tide, and I'll take you over here so you can see them while I'm talking, uh, when you go out at a certain tide, you actually can find them. You can just kayak out and find them and collect them. Most of these animals, a lot of these animals are things that you can, we, we have a permit to have these, so this isn't something that you could go out and collect and explore at your house. We have a, we have a permit that says that we're allowed to, to collect these so that we can show them to you. Um, but you can go out and see them at low tide. You can kayak out to different parts of Neatarts Bay or even walk out on the mudflats clamming. You might find some of these. A lot of the other animals were actually collected by Mr. Thomas and um, our friends over at Glen's Gizmos who brought you the science fair. Do you guys remember? Um, earlier in January, you guys got to come out for STEM night and explore a lot of science concepts. Well, uh, those, same, those same folks that run that business actually came out and helped us collect a lot of these animals by diving along the rocks in Neatarts Bay and exploring different sections 
so that we could um, bring you these amazing animals. Great. We have another question is how old can a crab get? How old can a crab get? Yeah, so most crabs that we see are going to be somewhere in the realm of uh, four years up to probably eight years old. They don't get very old. Um, I don't, there's some crabs that probably can get old, but most of our crabs are, you know, we, if we have a 12 year old crab, we have a pretty old crab and a pretty large crab. And so uh, most of them we get are going to be uh, less than that. Cool. Short All right. Crabs, they live maybe two years. They're short lived. Oh, oh sorry. Um, can rock crabs run? Uh, rock crabs can run, but not as good as uh, uh, the, whoa, one of that, that scallop just opened up and burped out a whole bunch of stuff and uh, then closed up again. So anyway, that was interesting. Okay, it, it distracted made, me. It made a big noise. I don't know it if you did. guys heard it. <laughs> we didn't get to hear it, no. <laughs> it sounded like you're popping your lips or something. Anyway, so when we talk about uh, crabs running, if you dive in the bay, rock crabs are running. Around the rocks they're very agile they can move really quickly around rocks and hide in rocks and get away dungeness are very clumsy around rocks they're a bay crab or a sand crab and so but they can really go fast and they can swim really fast and so uh dungeness when you're chasing them as a diver it's really hard to catch up to them so you have to plan your attack on a dungeness crab a rock crab you just got to get there in time to get him before he gets him, pin him against a rock to pick him up. They're a lot easier to get than dungeon ass crabs. Great question. Do we have any more, Megan? Uh, yeah, I'll do a couple. We've gotten a lot of questions, which is great. And I know we want to keep moving, but I do think some of these questions are great. Um, why do sand dollars have line, lines, L-I-N-E-S? Why do why sand do dollars have, have lines? Lines. Yeah, so, uh, so let's take a look at a sand dollar here. Uh, so if you look at the sand dollar, you can, on the top surface, you can see lines that come across. And where these little uh, areas are right here, that's the highest concentration of skin gills. That's where they actually breathe through little holes that are in their shell right there. And it may be really hard to see the holes, but you can sort of see little divots in, in amongst the spines on top. That's where they actually get most of their air, even though a lot of the skin gills have air attached to them. On the bottom, the lines that are there, you can see a line there and there and there and there and there. One here, they're kind of hard. They, they'll show up more in a little bit. Those are lines that are tied to the feeding. Those are the oral grooves. Oral means mouth. So those are the feeding tubes where they trap the food and then move it down those lines to the mouth. I can uh, get a dead one, a dead sand dollar that we picked up. They're just outside on the scaffolding there we'll bring it in you can see the lines a whole lot more clear and uh, so sand dollars live you know four years six years they don't live very long at all they're a short-lived animal at least these sand dollars are and uh, you can often on a sand dollar see little uh, areas that have been you know I got one over here the sanded mm -hmm. or did I put them up there? okay uh, that you can actually tell how old they are based on how how many lines it has in each one of its little plates that make up its shell so a and shell is made of, it was made of uh, proteins that glue sand grains together, crystals together of, uh, of uh, calcium carbonate. And it's in a form that's like limestone or a ragonite, it's called, they glue it together. And so a shell is really easy to break. So uh, the shells uh, fall apart really, really easy. You're starting to see the lines a little better on this one now. The top patterns where most of the skin gills are and most of the body organs are in this area, which is where it needs a lot of oxygen. And then you can see some of the grooves down here a little bit better now. And, that, and so okay. remember, we always like to point out where mouths are. And I don't know if you guys caught this or not when Mr. Thomas was talking, but the mouth is right there. Right on the bottom the surface and the center right there. So this is a sand dollar with grooves. Um, you know, I think there's one on that. Oh, I don't know. Chrissy, I've got another question for you. Okay. Um, our... Uh, one of our questions came from um, you talking about how um, sea stars uh, or starfish eat the, the mussels. Yeah. So we had a question that happened, or uh, actually it was similar to that, but uh, what if a sea cucumber runs out of guts to eat or one <laughs> runs out of guts to give out is the question. Uh, that's a really good question, actually. 
Um, and that, and so when a sea star is, is only going to spit its guts out as like the absolute last option, it doesn't, and it doesn't spit out everything it needs to survive. It just spits out a portion of it, right? And so if you can imagine you're a sea cucumber, you really don't want to get rid of anything that's going to help you survive unless you have to, right? So this sea cucumber has to be really scared to do it. Um, and then after it does that, if it gets in a bad situation again, it probably won't make it because it needs time to rebuild all that, to regrow all that um, inside its body, if that makes sense. So uh, once a sea cucumber does that, then they're actually extra vulnerable to, um, and to being eaten and attacked again because they don't have that defense anymore. Good question. All right. Um, these were all great questions. Thank you so much. Keep asking them and I'll keep asking them on your behalf. But um, Chrissy, Amy, and Mr. Thomas, let's, let's keep moving. Okay. Okay. I'm just showing you a sand dollar that's dead and you can see really clearly the food grooves where it feeds coming down through here. And if, and that's the mouth opening right there. And if you flip it over, you can see the really clear skin gills along the edge of where the, the looks like a starfish on the surface. And of course it is an, a, an echinoderm, it's related mm -hmm. to a starfish. And it looks like a starfish on the surface. It's just got a bunch of calcium glued around it. Has anybody ever found a, uh, we call that a test. When you, when you find a, uh, a sand dollar that doesn't, not alive anymore, it's washed up on the beach, it's called a test. Has anybody ever found one before? Have it in your home? Because that's really awesome. If you have one in your home, you're nodding, then you should find it after this and check it out because it's really, it's a really interesting animal. So cool. Cool stuff. You all are really good at asking questions. So let's take a look over here at this tank right here. This is our eelgrass and eelgrass um, is a, a type of a plant that's found inside estuaries where the water doesn't beat very much. So where it beats a lot, you get algaes. And where in the bay, you get a lot of stuff that looks like grass, eelgrass. And so if we look down into this eelgrass, we can see there's a lot of things within the eelgrass. So if we start at the top uh, up here, we can see, uh, in fact, I'll just show you. I just put my net in there and scooped through this top part and got some creatures in here. And so I'll just show you in this tank over here, kind of what was in the eelgrass in this, in that tank. So kind of looking in here, um, into this tank here. Let me move that out maybe. I should have maybe not put it on the stand because I'm not using the light. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, we'll just look at it inside. You can look in, you can see lots of little crabs in there. Can you see, I'm gonna put my hand in there. So you can see lots of little crabs. Can you see these crabs? Lots and lots of little crap. Oh, there's a shrimp. Can you see that shrimp? There's another crabs over there. Uh, we have lots of different types of creatures. Can you, isn't that amazing? Oh, here's another kind of a shrimp, a broken back shrimp. He's all bent funny. Can you see him? Right there. A lot of creatures in this tank. Well, let's go. Oh, here's our little hermit crab. That's a creature that... Oh, in an olive snail. That's a creature in a bay, the olive snail, and there's a hermit crab in there, little tiny hermit crab in there. Oh, our kindergartners uh, and first graders know about those. Yeah, so now come on over here and take a look at this tank towards the bottom. Oh, here's a cool, look on top right here. There's a cool, oh, I scared him. See that little creature right there jumping around? The little green one? That's a shrimp. That right there, a little green shrimp that likes to be on eelgrass, and he's sitting right there. Isn't that cool? Now look in the bottom of this tank. I'm just going to take my net and just kind of move it. And you can look at all the fish, all the eels, all the types of crabs that are in here. You guys see those things moving around and scurrying in there? Isn't that amazing? Oh, look at these eels in the corner over here. Oh my, look at those. Isn't that something? Eelgrass protects a lot of creatures. It's where a lot of babies come, in, come from. Um, it, it, uh, creatures like uh, some of the fish and things will move into eelgrass and lay their eggs. Uh, the babies will be reared there. A lot of the crabs are reared in eelgrass because eelgrass increases the amount of space that food can be found on. So on the bottom of the sand, like in this aquarium, there's only a little bit of space. 
But if you put eelgrass to, from the bottom to the top, it increases the space that creatures can live on by maybe 10,000 times. You get a lot more creatures when there's eelgrass in an area. So eelgrass and bays is really, really important. And they're, they slow down water, but they increase surface area. And a lot of things live on them that other things feed on. So that's a nursery. So lots and lots of babies live in eelgrass. And uh, we're gonna move on now over to a tank over here with Chrissy that's gonna look at another really cool spiny echinoderm that lives in rocky areas. Thanks, so what Amy is focusing on right now is another animal that's related to the sand dollar and related to the sea star. And you can see it has some wiggly things sticking out. Those are two feet. And you remember that the cucumbers and the sand and the sea stars all have these two feet. That is a sea urchin. It's a purple sea urchin. And it likes to live at the beach. It's mostly where you find it in the tide pools. It likes to live deeper down. Now I'm gonna kind of wiggle it. You can see that it really likes to stick itself on. So it has a really great adaptation to survive in these areas. It can hold on tight to rocks and not get swept out into the ocean. It also has a strategy where it can make itself a little tide pool home. It can actually use its sharp spines and the sharp teeth on the bottom. I was hoping you could see this. Let me see if I can take this tank off. It has a, a mouth. Thank you. Oops. Should just come out. Just take it out. There we go. So right there in the, on the bottom, it's kind of hard to see. It's a slightly darker area right now. There is the uh, urchin's mouth. And it actually has five really strong teeth that it uses to gra graze algae off rocks, little plants off rocks that it can eat, but it also can use these things to actually make a little hole in the rock and it makes itself its own personal little tide pool. So those are some of the strategies this animal uses to survive in that environment. Now I did promise that I would show you a, sand, a sea star that's getting ready to grow a new leg. I bet you guys would like to see this. What if you could grow a new leg? Wouldn't that be fascinating? So this sea star has lost its legs and it has three rays now. But right there is a little, little nub of something that's starting to grow. So as long as the sea star has about a third of its center part of its body, it will actually grow into, um, it will grow a new leg and grow into a new, a new uh, sea star. So Chrissy, we've got a question. Um, what is the most common color of sea urchins as well as sea stars? Sea urchins here on our coastline, um, the ones that you're most often to see are purple, right? The purple, the purple sea, sea urchin is the most common in the tide pools, but also you will see green. If you get deeper, you will see red, and they have longer spines. And there's even one that's kind of pink, right, Mr. Thomas? Yes, there yeah. is. Mm -hmm. So those are the colors. The one you're most often seeing is purple. That's the one you're going to most often, because it's the one that's easiest for us humans to get to. It's a great And what question. about starfish? Sea, st sea stars come in many different colors. Um, and I don't, there's not one color that's going to dominate another. And there's also a lot of different types of sea stars. So right here today, we had mostly Oprah sea stars, but there are many different types of sea stars in our tide pools, especially when you go explore in a really low tide, you can find some really interesting, interesting different types of sea stars. So I can't tell you a favorite color, like a dominant color, because they just have a wide range. It's sort of like how we all have different eye colors and hair colors. It's the same for sea stars. That's a great question. Well, we're, I want to show you the anemone before we say goodbye. And maybe if you guys have any last questions, you can ask them. There's one creature that we didn't, we didn't show you. So in this tank here, in these tanks, we have two different types of anemones, and there's a lot of different types of anemones that we have, and we're just scanned through them. So one of the ones that you see the most often is the giant green sea anemone, and we have one right here that's closed up, and you can see it kind of just looks like a blob of green, and then we have one right over here that's actually open. I bet that if you've gone to the tide pools, you have seen these. A lot of people think they look like a plant, and they really do. They look like a flower, but it's actually an animal that's related to a jellyfish. 
And the way this animal works is it pretty much tries to eat anything it can get into its mouth. And its mouth is that belly button looking like shaped thing right there in the center of its body. Um, it's a very simple animal. It basically has a big muscular body and a big stomach. So it brings everything it wants to eat into that hole, but also anything that it's done eating and digesting, it poops out of that hole too. So um, that's kind of how that animal works. Now when it catches food, so if I'm a little fish, oh, I'm a little fish, oh, and I sit here, ah, it's now stinging me. It doesn't hurt me because my fin is, is thick, but if you were a fish, it would capture you and kind of make it hard for you to move. And then slowly, this animal would kind of close up and look more like this one and pull whatever it was eating into its body and digest it. And that's how that guy works. Now this green sea anemone likes to hang out in the kind of lower tidal areas on beaches, but there are other types of sea anemones that live in the bay. And this one is one we don't get to see very often because we don't often get to get to, get to kind of dive down when it's open. This is called a burrowing sea anemone. It's actually really pretty and it has this red stripes and white stripes on his tentacles. And it will actually pull itself down under the sediment to survive in the bay. So that's kind of two different, the same animal, yeah, same type of animal using different strategies to live in two different habitats, which is really interesting. And Chrissy, we have um, some questions that are about sea anemones. How long do they live? Hmm, that's a good question. Mr. Thomas, do you know? Uh, see, the sea anemone is, uh, everything I've read about sea anemones says they're pretty short-lived too. They don't live for huge periods of time for our typical uh, Christmas anemones or aggregating anemones. They're really ones you see commonly all over everything at the rocks. They have short lifespans. When you get to the larger anemones, they can live quite a while. And I don't know if it's into the 30-year range or if it's shorter than that, but they can live for a long time. And some of the longest lived ones are the green one like you looked at over here. The elegantisma is one that lives for a long period of time because it picks up uh, chlorophyll from some of the things that it eats and it can actually act as a plant kind of in that it makes its own food, a certain amount of its own food and doesn't have to eat as much food. So it's easier for it to stay and live longer with less stress. All right, um, while you're over there, uh, we, we got a question if uh, sea cucumbers can dance can dance. Well, that is a fascinating question. So sea cucumbers, well, let's take a look at them. They sure can move um, and they kind of twist themselves up in interesting patterns. I have not seen a sea cucumber dance, but maybe we should put some music on after this and just see what happens. But um, they, can, they can move their bodies in different ways. They can, as you can see, as I pick this guy up, He's actually scrunching himself together like this. He's scrunching up. So they can change their body shape to be more like a ball, or they can actually, which is happening right in front of your eyes right now, actually. This guy was about this long when I picked him up. Uh, so they certainly can do some shape changing, dancing. Hmm. This is another. That's, that's not something I've seen, but. Uh, there, there are uh, sea uh, cucumbers that are burrowing sea cucumbers. And they have tentacles that come out of the water and they look kind of like a sea anemone. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're really brilliant orange and they come up and those tentacles kind of dance, but I think the sea cucumber is just sitting there buried in the sand and rocks while, it, while the tentacles are dancing looking for food. Mm -hmm. So it's dance would be a dance for food, attracting food mm -hmm. more than a dance, a typical dance. And I've, I've actually seen these cucumbers doing something similar to what Mr. Thomas is saying. And it will actually put, it's right here, and it has kind of these very cauliflower-y looking, see, I don't know if anybody's parents make you eat cauliflower, I like cauliflower, looking appendages that come out. And then they'll take it inside one at a time, sort of like if you ate Doritos and your fingers got all cheesy and you wanted to lick it off, you would put one finger in at a time yeah. and lick it off. It's kind of what it looks like. It's pretty fun to see. It's yeah. a great question. That Do we is. have any more? And what are sea cucumbers predators? What well, let's eat a sea cucumber. Well, uh, I, I believe things like uh, sea otters and things like that eat sea cucumbers. Uh, seals, things like that eat sea, sea cucumbers. I don't know of a lot of other predators other than People. mammals. People eat sea cucumbers. <laughs> yep, we eat sea cucumbers. I don't know of a lot of predators that aren't uh, larger fish or things like that. All right, a couple more questions. Um, how long does it take for a starfish to regrow its leg? 
Oh, wow. I think that that varies. I think it depends on um, how healthy it is, what the environmental conditions are like. So, you know, is, is there food? Is, is it um, how much of its, um, you know, it needs to have a section of this middle part of its body right here. So it needs to have a good chunk of this center section in order to regrow a leg. And so it would depend on how much of that is intact. Wouldn't you agree with that, Mr. Thomas? Yes, yes. So it's really hard to put a time frame on that because it just depends on, on how the animal's doing and ha what happens to make it lose that, that ray. Okay, and um, we have a question and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add my own editorial to it. Um, in, <laughs> in, the, um, in the bay, what animal do you find the most? Okay, in the bay, what do we find the most? Yeah, so uh, undoubtedly the most numerous animals in the ocean are shrimp and mollusks, clams. And so if you're on the surface of the sand, you see shrimp everywhere. If we take and run a, a, a net across the surface of the sand or eelgrass, we'll come up with probably more than 90% some kind of uh, shrimp little baby crabs or shrimp or uh, all kinds of shrimp and lots of varieties. If you go under the sand, it is loaded with worms and with clams and probably clams are the most of the biomass. That means the most amount of living material is going to be clam tissue and there's a lot of clams under the surface. Some of you in fifth, when you get to fifth grade will go clamming with us hopefully and uh, <laughs> you'll have a chance to see just how many clams can be in a really small space. It is cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, are sea urchins poisonous? Not the sea urchins here. There are sea urchins in different parts of the world that do have toxins in their spines, but the sea urchins on our coast are not, are not, um, are not venomous or poisonous. Great, great question. Wait, well, I'll take you over here while you're getting more questions and show you some barnacles feeding. I don't think we did that yet. So this tank here is really, these two tanks are really great. Mr. Thomas is setting them up at the boathouse. So when the boathouse opens, you can come and see them. One's going to be more like a bay and the other one's going to be more like the ocean. And over there, Amy is focusing on some barnacles feeding right now. You can see that. A barnacle is actually um, related to a crab, which is interesting. You wouldn't think so. And when it is a baby, last week we had a lot of baby barnacles in here. We do not have them today. Um, but when it's a baby, it actually swims around. And those, those kind of feathery legs that you're looking at is what it uses to swim. And then as it gets older and decides to stop swimming, it will actually glue itself down to a mussel shell or a rock and it will use what it was swimming with to help it feed now, which is kind of the cool thing. Any other questions, Megan? We've got two. Um, can we see sea slugs eggs? Oh, yes, I forgot to show them to you. What a fantastic idea. We should definitely do that. What time are we at? We're at 11.10, so we're, we're just about at the time. So this might be one of the last questions. Okay, so uh, the water level dropped a little bit in our tank when we turned the pumps off to talk to you. But right here is the, is the eggs and um, they got a little sediment on them right now because there's a little dirty in the bay, the water that we brought in. But if it was underwater, it would almost look like a, a really delicate ribbon um, and uh, more sort of like a white rose. And they just kind of circle around and lay these eggs. And what, are, what is cr uh, the crab's favorite food? Uh, crabs eat lots of different things. Um, They're scavengers, yep. <laughs> so they eat anything that dies, they'll investigate it, but they like fresh food too, so they like to smash up mm -hmm. uh, uh, shellfish like sure. clams or mussels and eat those things. We've washed them in our tanks yeah. over here, take on mussels and crush them, uh, and so uh, they'll eat anything they can get their, their claws on, they'll eat. So 
but they're scavengers. That's where they fit in the food chain is a scavenger, meaning they just eat, they just eat uh, in anything basically that dies or have recently dead. But they're uh, opportunists. That means they, any opportunity they have to eat anything, I bet some of you are that way when you see food on a table and there's a chance to eat some dessert or to eat something you really like, you just eat that. Easy. Maybe only that. That's the way crabs are. They're kind of like you that way. They're opportunists. They just eat anything they have the opportunity to eat. <laughs> if they can see it and they can catch it, they'll eat it. And, and what likes to eat crabs? That's a good question. So, um, some of the favorite things that eat crabs are shorebirds. So seagulls, shorebirds, like even great blue herons and stuff, they'll wander around on the shore or at low tide and grab crab and eat crab. They love crab. There's also uh, a lot of the uh, mammals uh, that are in the ocean uh, can actually eat crab, can uh, find ways to eat crab. Uh, but probably the biggest predators are seabirds. An octopus. An octopus. An octopus eat a crab. love yeah, they crab. Love, they oh. capture and devour crabs. Yeah, octopi love mm -hmm. crab. All right. That's it. All right. Those are all the questions that we've gotten today. Great. All right. Well, I just want to thank you all for joining us today, and I hope that you learned a little something new about some of the animals that are in the oceans and the bays, and that you also learned a little bit about what it takes to survive. Um, at the beach in a tide pool with crashing waves and with sometimes the beach is flooded with water and sometimes it's not during low tide and how these animals survive in these places. And the same thing for the bay. You know, sometimes our bays are flooded with, with water and sometimes the water recedes during low tide and it starts to dry out. There's other things too, like how much fresh water's there. And so all these animals are navigating these things in these different ways. And I hope that we gave you a tiny little taste of some of that. We did send your teachers some other things they can share. Um, so you might see some extra videos that talk a little bit more about uh, tide pool life and how, what it takes to survive there. And you also might see one that's specifically about Neetarks Bay and kind of the unique things that happen in Neetarks Bay and some of the animals you might see there. Um, so we are just so happy that you joined us and we hope you had fun. Um, to my kindergarten and first graders, I really miss visiting with you. I hope that you guys have a fantastic summer, and I'll let Mr. Thomas and Amy say goodbye too. Well, farewell. It's been really fun visiting with you, even though it's over the computer. I don't get to see you directly. It's really fun. Have a great time. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Have a great summer. All right, we're gonna sign off. It was great to see everyone. Bye.